Okay, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7 is where we are today. We're going to explore the third commandment in God's heart and His will for our lives through this commandment. And I want to start with this. When I was a newlywed, there was actually a short season, a very short season, in which I belonged to a local gym. And, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't say belong because I don't know if I really belonged there, but I would go occasionally. And the gym is a pretty unique place, and it's got unique people in it. I never enjoyed talking with anybody there or making eye, eye contact with anybody there because, well, conversations at the gym are kind of weird. You know, hey, bro, what you working out today? Oh, it's, uh, it's leg day. It's chest day. What are you working out? I'm working out some issues from my childhood, but I don't think you're prepared for that. <laughs> And then you got the people that are groaning and moaning, they're grunting, they're snorting. A lot of people are staring at themselves in these gigantic mirrors, checking out their pump. And there's a sign above the sink in the restroom at this particular gym that said, respect the privacy of others. Do not take pictures of yourself in the bathroom mirror. (laughs) What a culture we live in, huh? And we have a word for people who are infatuated with themselves, who are taking these mirror pictures in the gym. Uh, Sorry if I offend you, but, well, actually, I'm not very sorry. (laughs) The word for that is vain. V-A-I-N, vain. And that word vain is an interesting word because it has two very different definitions. The first definition is this. To have an excessively high opinion of yourself, your appearance, your reflection. And then the second definition is this, useless, worthless, pointless, futile, profane, irreverent, in a common way, careless, or empty. That's the second definition of vain. And it is that second definition for the word vain that God will use in the third commandment. Now, a little bit of background before we jump into the text today. Remember, God is revealing his presence and his power by descending in cloud on top of Mount Sinai in the desert. All eyes are on the Lord now, and he tells his people that he's freed from Egyptian captivity and led through the wilderness. Now he's telling them how to live in such a way as to show him that they love him, that they're friends of God and not his enemies. And so he gives them the Ten Commandments. And the first one that we saw, the first word, so to speak, in Hebrew, I am your God. There is no other. You shall not have any other gods before me. And then the second word, the second commandment was this. Don't create a false image of who I am to worship. I want you to worship the real me. So don't make for yourself any idol, any likeness of what's in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Don't make false gods, false images of me. Worship the real me for who I am. So with that as a background, let us now read the text. We're going to pick it up in verse 1 of the chapter, Exodus 20, verse 1. Read along with me. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, or any likeness of what is in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the water underneath the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. In today's text, verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Okay, so the very first thing we need to understand in our first point today is this. We don't name God. We don't name God. We as humans don't name God, but rather God graciously revealed his name to us. And this is one of the things that sets God apart. Not a single one of us was born and then decided our own name. You know, on October 9th, 1986, I didn't come out of the womb and say, call me Jonathan. No, rather my name was given to me by my parents. 
But God is completely different. No one gave him his name. Remember, in Exodus chapter 3, we saw that Moses asked what God's name was. Who shall send me? He asked him. And God told him. And what did he say? He said, Yahweh. Remember the tetragrammaton, those four letters, Y-H-W-H. That is the one who is, the ising one, Yahweh. So because it is true that no one named God, it is also true that we don't have the right to exercise authority over God's name. We can't use his name any way we want. He has his name trademarked, if you will. It's copyrighted. It's patented. He gets to define it. The name of God represents the person of God, and that's why it is so important. I'd like to play you an audio clip from gotquestions.org about the names of God. Did you know that God has revealed a number of names for himself, a number of titles for himself throughout scripture? It's a fascinating study. So let's just take a few minutes to consider the names of God as they're presented in scripture. What are the different names of God and what do they mean? Each of the many names of God describes a different aspect of his many faceted character. Here are some better known names of God in the Bible. El Eloha, God, mighty, strong, prominent. Etymologically, El appears to mean power and might. El is associated with other qualities such as integrity, jealousy, and compassion, but the root idea of might remains. Elohim, God, creator, mighty, and strong. The plural form of Eloha, which accommodates the doctrine of the Trinity. From the Bible's first sentence, the superlative nature of God's power is evident as God, Elohim, speaks the world into existence. El Shaddai, God Almighty, the Mighty One of Jacob, speaks to God's ultimate power over all. Adonai, Lord, used in place of Yahweh, which was thought by the Jews to be too sacred to be uttered by sinful men. In the Old Testament, Yahweh is more often used in God's dealings with His people while Adonai is used more when he deals with the Gentiles. Yahweh, Jehovah, Lord. Strictly speaking, the only proper name for God, translated in English Bibles as Lord, all capitals, to distinguish it from Adonai. The revelation of the name is first given to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. I am who I am. This name specifies an immediacy, a presence. Yahweh is present, accessible, near to those who call on him for deliverance, forgiveness, and guidance. Yahweh Jireh, the Lord will provide. The name memorialized by Abraham when God provided the ram to be sacrificed in place of Isaac. Ah. Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals. I am Jehovah who heals you, both in body and soul. In body, by preserving from and curing diseases, and in soul, by pardoning iniquities. Yahweh Nisi, the Lord our banner where Banner is understood to be a rallying place. This name commemorates the desert victory over the Amalekites in Exodus 17. Yahweh Mekedesh, the Lord who sanctifies, makes holy. God makes it clear that He alone, not the law, can cleanse His people and make them holy. Yahweh Shalom, the Lord our peace. The name given by Gideon to the altar he built after the angel of the Lord assured him he would not die as he thought he would after seeing him. Yahweh Elohim, Lord God, a combination of God's unique name, Yahweh, and the generic Lord, signifying that He is the Lord of Lords. Yahweh Tzidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. As with Yahweh Mekedesh, it is God alone who provides righteousness to man, ultimately in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ, who became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Yahweh Rohi, the Lord our shepherd. After David pondered his relationship as a shepherd to his sheep, he realized that was exactly the relationship God had with him. And so he declares, Yahweh Rohi is my shepherd. I shall not want. Yahweh Shema, The Lord is there. The name ascribed to Jerusalem and the temple there, indicating that the once departed glory of the Lord had returned. Yahweh Sabaoth, The Lord of hosts. Hosts meaning hordes both of angels and of men. He is the Lord of the host of heaven and of the inhabitants of the earth, of Jews and Gentiles, of rich and poor, master and slave. 
The name is expressive of the majesty, power, and authority of God and shows that he is able to accomplish what he determines to do. El Elyon, Most High, derived from the Hebrew root for go up or ascend, so the implication is of that which is the very highest. El Elyon denotes exaltation and speaks of absolute right to lordship. El Roy, God of Seeing, the name ascribed to God by Hagar, alone and desperate in the wilderness after being driven out by Sarah. When Hagar met the angel of the Lord, she realized she had seen God himself in a theophany. She also realized that El Roy saw her in her distress and testified that he is a God who lives and sees all. El Olam, Everlasting God. God's nature is without beginning or end, free from all constraints of time. And he contains within himself the very cause of time itself. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. El Gibor, Mighty God. The name describing the Messiah, Christ Jesus, in this prophetic portion of Isaiah. As a powerful and mighty warrior, the Messiah, the mighty God, will accomplish the destruction of God's enemies and rule with a rod of iron. Got questions? The Bible has answers, and we'll help you find them. All right. I love that resource, and I highly recommend it, gotquestions.org. But anyways, back to the text. God clearly says here, don't take my name in vain. But what exactly does that mean? How does one do that? How does one take God's name in vain? And this morning, I'd like us to consider at least four different ways we can be in danger of doing this. Four different ways of taking God's name in vain. Now, the first is this, cursing God's name, cursing God's name. And this is perhaps what we all initially think of when we hear this commandment. Watch your mouth. Be careful about what you say about God. Be thoughtful and measured. Many people use God's name as a means of emphasizing something. Others constantly call down divine damnation on whatever or whoever is their latest source of frustration. They use the name of Jesus Christ our great God and Savior has an exclamation point after something as silly as stubbing their toe or dropping an ice cream cone. Maybe you've seen that semi-truck that's been parked around town, uh, especially on freeway overpasses. There's a Christian owner of this semi-truck, and he parks it in public places so that people can see it. And on the side it says, Jesus is Lord, not a swear word. Now, I have to admit that there's something about using God's name in vain that drives me nuts. No, I'm not holier than thou. There's just something about the use of God's name in that way that makes my skin crawl. It's it's disturbing to me. I have a visceral reaction to it. And I also find it very fascinating that in our culture, which is increasingly becoming non-Christian or post-Christian, or you could even say anti-Christian, people can't even seem to cuss without using the name of the God of the Bible. Is that not a little weird? That it's consistently the Christian God's name that flies out of the mouth of frustrated people. I've never seen someone stub their toe or take a hammer to their thumb and say, Aphrodite, ah, Thor, Allah, Confucius, darn it. (laughs) Instead, it's the Christian God that gets blasphemed. What does it tell us about the human condition that the name of the Christian God is consistently blasphemed. And I actually see this as clear evidence of the existence of our God. Luke 6.45 says this, The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when a non-Christian says God's name in vain, I see that deep down, they know that God is real, and in their moments of sinful rage and frustration, they direct their anger towards Him. So, back to the commandment. Clearly, we see that God does not want His holy name misused as an exclamation point in rage. But that's not all that the third commandment is about. Now, verse 7 says, Do not take, which literally means to lift up, exalt, carry, or bear. God says, don't lift up my name in any way that is trivial, in a way that is useless, inconsequential, or false, or that ignores that I am the final authority in life. Then there's other ways for us to do this 
than simply using his name as a cuss word. And another way, the second way of taking God's name in vain that we're going to consider this morning is this, making false prophecies, making false prophecies. Now, if you read your Bible, you're going to quickly discover that our God doesn't like it when we make stuff up and then turn it around and blame it on him. It is an extremely weighty thing, a big deal to say, God told me blank and then insert something that he didn't say. Listen to what Jeremiah 14, 14 says about this. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them, nor commanded them, nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. God hates lies told in his name. He hates having to say, I never said that. And this could be that weird TV preacher that's on at 2 in the morning saying, Yeah, Jesus told me he's coming back on October 31st this year. And Jesus himself clearly said in Matthew 24, 36, that nobody knows the day or the hour of his return, but God the Father. But there's also more discreet false prophecies. Things like people saying, hey, um, God told me that we need to break up. (laughs) Maybe somebody's told you that before. Maybe you've been guilty of saying that before in high school or college. And it's like, really? Really? Come on, man. (laughs) Don't blame that junk on God. How about this? Rather just tell the truth. Baby, you know, we've been dating for six months, and last night I just had this epiphany. You're a weirdo. I'm done. (laughs) How about that? Rather than God told me we need to break up. Now, here's some more examples. God told me not to serve in VBS this year. Well, you know, I, th- I think it's a little strange that God would tell you no, because, well, we are in desperate need of volunteers, but okay, couldn't you have just cut out the middleman and just told us that? Or how about this one? God told me to get a divorce. God will never tell us to do something that is contrary to his revealed word. God does not change, nor does his word. I remember when I was on a missions trip to India in 2011, This man came up to me and said, God told me that your firstborn child will be a son. And then guess what happened? In 2015, I had a firstborn child and she was a girl. And then in 2016, we had our second and she was a girl. And so what this man told me was a false prophecy. In Deuteronomy 13, we learned that ancient Israel actually had a death penalty for those who gave false and deceptive prophecies. Maybe I should reach back out to that brother I met over there and share that Bible verse with him. But um, (laughs) anyways, so many people play the divine sovereignty card because, well, who can argue with that? If you say, God told me, people are making stuff up all the time and then turn it on God so that nobody can hold them accountable or ask any questions. And that's just not right. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said in this sermon he preached called The Paraclete in October of 1872. He talked about this very topic and he said this, take care never to impute the vain imaginings of your fancy to him, that is God. I have seen the spirit of God shamefully dishonored by persons, I hope they were insane, who have said that they have had this and that revealed to them. There has not for some years passed over my head a single week in which I have not been pestered with the revelations of hypocrites or maniacs. Semi-lunatics are very fond of coming with messages from the Lord to me, and it may save them some trouble if I tell them once and for all that I will have none of their stupid messages. When my Lord and Master has any message to me, He knows where I am, and He will send it to me direct, and not by madcaps. Never dream that events are revealed to you by heaven, or you may come to be like those idiots who dare impute their blatant follies to the Holy Spirit. If you feel your tongue itch to talk nonsense, trace it to the devil, not to the Spirit of God. Whatever is to be revealed by the Spirit to any of us is in the Word of God already. He adds nothing to the Bible and never will. Let persons who have revelations of this, that, 
and the other go to bed and wake up in their senses. I only wish they would follow the advice and no longer insult the Holy Spirit by laying their nonsense at his door. Whoa, Uncle Charlie is mad in that one. But (laughs) anyways, I think he makes a great point. Simply this, that lifting up God's name in this way, making false prophecy using God's name in vain is forbidden by God and brings dishonor to him. And so we should definitely avoid that. Do not be hasty to say, God told me, when you're not 100% sure and if it doesn't agree with the word of God. Now, the third way that we could take God's name in vain is this, by making false pretenses. Making false pretenses. Pretense comes from the word pretend, and it means an attempt to make something that is not the case appear true. That's what pretense is. Now, Jesus said this in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Here Jesus warns against selfishly using God's name for our own benefit, wanting all of the benefits and none of the commitments of associating with him, saying one thing but not living our lives in such a way that shows we believe what we say. In other words, offering God lip service and nothing more. That's a false pretense. God wants to be the Lord we follow, not just the banner that we wave. He wants our lives to be committed to him. And so we take God's name in vain when we don't live out our faith. We just simply use his name as a magic word or want to associate with Christ, but not really live the Christian life. A key evidence of false pretense is a refusal to repent. I'm fine. No, I'm good. I've got nothing to repent of, and our lives are untouched by Jesus. Jesus wants to root out our sin, being selfish or greedy or lustful or racist or unloving. Jesus wants to remove that from us and sanctify us. Now, our last way of taking God's name in vain that I want us to consider this morning is this, making false promises. We can take God's name in vain by making false promises promises. That is, saying things to God that are not true. And unfortunately, we do this all the time. We declare with our lips things that aren't true. And it seems like one of the most frequent places we do this is at church when we sing. You know, you see those words on the screen, and in our spirits, we are guilty of not telling the truth, even though we're singing the words on the screen like, Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. And the question is, well, do I really? Can I sing that honestly? Possible other ways we take God's name in vain are by our hypocrisy, not living up to our profession, by covenant breaking, not performing our vows to God, by rash or false swearing, by witnessing to a lie. I swear to God, I swear to God. There's so many ways that we can take God's name in vain and God doesn't want us to do that. He forbids it in the third commandment. And to conclude, we don't want to do any of these things. Why? Because God's name is majestic. Listen to Psalm 8 verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. Jesus, during his life, patiently taught his disciples how to address God. He said this in Matthew 6, verse 9, Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed means holy, set apart, high and lifted up. Hallowed be your name, God. And we learn from Philippians 2 that one day, even blasphemers will bow their knee at the name of Jesus. Listen to this, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Paul writes, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, 
although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There are so many times we have broken the third commandment. We've taken God's name in vain, but the good news is this, my friends, that Jesus was crucified so that all of our sins, even our vain use of God's precious and perfect name, could be totally and absolutely forgiven. And because of that, we lift up his name, the name of Jesus Christ, the name that is above every other name, and we bow our knees to him, our Lord, our great God and Savior. And today, if you've never confessed your sin, if you've never repented of your sin and put your full trust in Jesus Christ, I urge you to do that today. He lived the perfect life for you. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and he rose again on the third day, conquering your sin and death forever. If you would just trust in him, you will be saved. That's the promise of the gospel. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow our hearts now before you and thank you for revealing to us your name. Thank you that you are a God who wants to be known and that you revealed yourself through Jesus Christ, whose very name means Savior, Messiah, the Anointed One. Father, we love to worship you. We want to continue to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to hold your name up high and not take it in vain. God, give us a reverence for your name. And thank you that we can bear your name as Christians, that is, little Christs in this world. Father, help us to do honor to you by the way that we live. We now repent of any sin that we need to. Father, thank you for your full pardon, your forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the truth of the gospel that we can trust in you for salvation. And you are faithful and just to forgive us of all of our unrighteousness. Lord, if there's anybody who is hearing this message now who needs to make that decision to follow Jesus, would they do so now? Perhaps praying something like this in their heart. Heavenly Father, I've sinned against you. But I turn from that sin now and turn to Jesus Christ. I believe in what he did on the cross for me. That he bore my sins on that cross. That he was buried and that he rose again on the third day. I trust him now as God and Savior. Thank you, God, for your forgiveness and the hope of eternal life. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.